So I'm going to start by just asking the two of you, like, who are you? Why are you here? Why should we listen to what you have to say? <laughs> who are you, David? Who am I? That's a that's actually a hard question. Um, yeah, I will go first. Uh, my name is David McGill. Um, I am currently working as a contractor for uh, Insight Global. Uh, the, the contract that I'm on is for Optum, and they're in the healthcare industry. Um, more recently, I was with uh, RSI as a principal SDET. Uh, they're at, out of the Oklahoma City office. They're based out of Atlanta. And then I was, um, I won't go through my entire background, but prior to that, I was with Sonic Corporate. Um, so I was there about three, a little over three years doing software testing, um, senior uh, quality engineer, software test engineer. So um, part of the mobile ahead, you know, order ahead, mobile uh, rollout and integration to the POS system. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I have a computer science degree. I'm from Oklahoma, uh, more Oklahoma originally, and I love testing. Awesome. Good intro. How about you, Floyd? Hi, I'm Floyd. Um, I am uh, almost 20 years into writing software professionally. I started my career in software doing quality assurance, uh, some of that being manual testing and some of it writing what we called testware. Um, so we, as a, in my very first programming job, really as a QA, we wrote toolkits for other developers to use. So testing those toolkits meant writing code to put those toolkits through their paces. Um, since then, I've um, been a software engineer, software architect, director of technology um, at multiple companies. I've pulled multiple companies out of the fire because they were having quality problems that were like threatening the company's, you know, primary revenue source and like, hey, this if we don't fix this quality problem, we're going under. We got to do something about it. Um, I currently run a company called Canyon Trail, whose entire purpose is to help software organizations figure out how to build software well. Yeah, and if you all missed it, in October, Floyd gave a talk on um, quality and testing. And that's kind of, I think, what, what spurred this is there might have been more like follow-up questions. Uh, so if anyone has not watched that, it's on Techlahoma's YouTube channel. And I think it was a great uh, talk going through different types of testing. And so that's one of our first questions on the list is, um, like, what, what exactly do you mean by testing when you say that? Um, what are the different types? And uh, I'll let either one of you take it away. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. So anytime you hear me say test, unless I say manual test, I mean an automated test. Um, and not all, not all kinds of manual tests or automated tests are created equal. So if, if you're not familiar with it, I would strongly recommend getting familiar with the testing pyramid because it helps you sort of look at the big picture of when we're doing testing, how much of what kind of testing do we need to do? And that of course boils down to how much of what kind of tests to do. Anything to add, David? Um, yeah, I think, um, and, and in some circles, and I'll kind of steal a little bit of uh, Michael Bolton and James Box uh, theories, right, on checking, right, versus testing or automated checking. So they, they go very much in depth around uh, what humans are good at and what computers are good at. Um, if you've ever done any programming, you know that it will only do what you tell it to. So if you tell it to see, you know, what is the name of this, uh, this label, it will only check that, right? The rest of the screen could look like garbage and not be rendered at all. But that label is named that and it will move on and you will have a green test. So um, th there is a lot to it. And uh, I think doing the, the testing using automation frees up the, the manual tester, if you will, uh, to do things that, that they're good, with, good at. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that as well. Um, I think you're absolutely spot on in saying there are things that computers are good at and things that humans are good at. Um, humans are in general really, really bad at following repetitive, rote, tedious, step-by-step -step instructions. They get bored. Matter of fact, they don't. <laughs> right, right. Uh, they get bored, they get frustrated, they skip steps, they um, mistype things, they get stressed out if it's, you know, the 11th hour and everybody's waiting on them. Um, the rest of it probably on the works. Other hand, say again? <laughs> the rest of it probably works. Yeah. And, like, computers don't have that problem. Um, not only do they not have that problem, they're also so much faster than humans at doing that kind of stuff, and they're cheaper than humans at doing that kind of stuff. 
Um, it kind, of, kind of sounds like I'm picking on humans. Um, I'm not. It's just that computers are also really, really bad at judgment calls. They're really bad at big picture thinking. And that's the kind of stuff when you talk about testing, those are the kinds of things that you want humans involved with. You want them making judgment calls. You want them, you want them looking at stuff that's qualitative instead of quantitative. Yeah, I think I, I love, I use the word feel a lot whenever I, I talk with developers or product owners or anyone, I say, you know, when you're using this, you know, the story's finished, right? How, when you're using it, how do you feel? Does it feel like you're, you know, being productive or do you feel kind of like you're clicking a lot or, you know, you don't have a good feeling, right? No, no level of automation will ever be able to give you some, you know, that kind of an emotional response to using something. And if you're writing an API and it's only going to be ever consumed by another computer, maybe you don't worry about the feeling too much. But if you're exposing any kind of a UI, you know, filling out forms, I, I know there are forms that I prefer to fill out and forms that I prefer not to fill out. <laughs> uh, and so as a tester, right, you have to take on that user uh, experience, that persona. And, you know, that that's part of the output of, of a test exercise is, did, did you enjoy, you know, your time doing that? Or was it just very painful and you hope you don't have to do it again? Yeah. And I would even add to that, that even API design, if you approach it from a testing perspective, um, and, and from like a, the human testing perspective, somebody somewhere is going to have to write code that consumes that API. Yeah. Is, is the process of consuming that API tedious or is it straightforward? Are you right. So then your API? user is the developer. Yeah. Wonderful. That's right. Wonderful. That's right. Um, Joshua Block, one of the, um, I don't know that he still is, but he was one of the um, architects at Google who, who's primarily known in the Java world. He says, you should write APIs that are easy to use and hard to misuse. Hmm. And like, that's one of those developer user experience things that, that you can really get into at, at the API design level. Can I, can I demonstrate how this is, this is an API that's easy to misuse. And I would call that an API design bug. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah I, I miss you. I miss use APIs all the time. <laughs> and I know that y'all could just continue talking for the whole hour, but we do have some questions from Twitch. Perfect. Gary was asking how are tests defined? What determines if the test coverage is proper? What do you do to defend against test smells, meaning poorly defined tests? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll jump in on that first. So um, can you reread those questions? Yeah, yeah there's so three of them. Right? The so how are the tests defined? OK, so let, let's pick on that one. Um, how are tests defined? So um, a good automated test has, in general, three phases. Um, and they're, they're, they all start with A, a range act and assert. So a range is where you get your data, your objects, whatever sort of prepared for whatever scenario it is that you want to prove something about. So you arrange your data, you arrange your objects, you arrange your um, your API in whatever, whatever fashion that you need. Um, act is where you actually perform something. And then assert is where you validate, did, did the thing that I just performed behave the way I expected it to? So for instance, if you're validating um, like an ar arithmetic front function, your arrange would be, I have two arguments, two and three. Act would be capturing the value of two plus three somewhere. And then assert would be making sure that that value you captured equals five. So that's yeah, how I like that. Defined. Do, you, do you want anything on how our test defined? And the next question is, what determines if the test coverage is proper? So I'll take test coverage. Um, so there's an old adage in testing, right? You're never done. Um, there is always something, right, that can be tested. Uh, so coverage can mean a lot of things. Um, a lot of times, because we are software developers, we think, well, I'm going to check and see if I have code coverage, right? Tests written to cover the code. Um, and what you'll find is that the easy things to test and cover are what get done first and sometimes nothing else, right? Because the rest of it is difficult. And maybe it's because of the way that the code is arranged, right? Architected or modularized. They find that it's difficult, right? To get, you know, a single responsibility out of a particular function or a method. And so they just kind of throw their hands up and say, well, we won't need that one for now, right? We'll come back 
So you, you'll end up getting what, you know, kind of the number out there is 80% sometimes, which is a little bit arbitrary, but you'll get 80% coverage and coverage of what, right? Uh, it may not cover the login screen, but you've got 80% of something that will never, ever get gotten to because there's no menu to it. <laughs> so that's where I feel like the human tester, right, can come in and say, if we've got three sections, let's make sure we've got tests, right? At least five tests on each section, right? And let's make sure that those five things are the things that people do the most or that they have to be able to do or they can't finish using the product. So I kind of define coverage to be that latter. Um, they call it kind of gross functionality. If you were using tax software and it couldn't like calculate what tax you owe, that would be a, that would be a bug. But if the colors are wrong, we can probably work with that. So. Yeah, and I, I would also say that that code coverage, um, and and I, I think let's let's try to be clear about when we say coverage because I really like David your your um, your characterization of when you say coverage, you're talking about things that an end user experiences, and I think that's really really key. Um, so I'm assuming that the question was maybe maybe related to code coverage. Code coverage is a really terrible target. It's a horrible, horrible target. And I've seen teams over and over again because somebody set an arbitrary target. Oh, our code <coughs> coverage is at 40%. I want it to get to 50% by the end of the year. So they go in and they write absolutely worthless tests, tests that are actually not doing the job that tests are supposed to do, which is telling you when, when key functionality is broken. Instead, the, the tests are just arbitrarily done to make sure that we've got we've had some path somewhere through the code so that the code coverage number goes up. Um, and now you have to maintain that test code. Yes. That didn't help you at all. <laughs> yes. It's, it's like adding dead weight to an airplane yeah. because somebody said the airplane needs to weigh this much. That's right. And those are great answers. Uh, there's another question from Gary. What do you do to defend against test smells, meaning poorly defined tests? I think maybe you just answered that, but do you have anything? Cover your nose, right? Because <laughs> you mentioned like this dead weight of tests. Uh, do you have anything to add as far as um, how to prevent that? Um, uh, so I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, tests should be intent revealing. Good tests read like documentation. And if, if you're ever in a situation where somebody comes to you and they say, you can throw away exactly one of either your production code or your tests, and you're not confident that you can rebuild the production code from your tests, that means you probably have bad tests. So if, if ever writing the process of writing tests, especially if we're talking about low level, fine grained unit tests, ever becomes tedious or difficult, that means that your tests are telling you something. Your tests are telling you your code is not easy to test and you need to refactor because code and tests moving forward in time, if you listen to them, they'll tell you, I'm getting gross and I need some cleanup. I, I think, um, I like that answer as well. Um, I would say that a test smell is any test that you can write in isolation. If you can sit and write a test and you feel like you've accomplished something and you haven't spoken with the product owner or the developer that's been working on that story or another tester, right? And you didn't need any information from them, no, no conversation. Um, you probably have been practicing, right? With your guitar and they've been practicing with their saxophone and you're not entirely sure that either of you are on the right, you don't have the right song, right? So you're gonna to come together for your duet, you know, and, and it's gonna be, it's gonna sound awful. So I say that tests are an excellent place, right? Along with, you know, your user stories to have conversations about, you know, what, is, what did the product owner mean when they said, you know, make the notification visible, right? Is that a pop-up box? Is that change the color of the text? Is that, I mean, what is that, right? And those are the things that humans are good at, right? Having conversations and getting that shared understanding and ubiquitous language down pat. That's what the intention behind the stories are, right? And, and tests are a good place to, to come to an agreement on. I, I love that. Um, I, I love that perspective because you're absolutely right that those tests need to be tied to some sort of end user value. And, and regardless of what what process you're using, if it's Scrum or you know Kanban or even if you're doing some sort of waterfall thing, 
really as much as possible every single line of code whether it's whether it's your your application code or test code every single line needs to be in pursuit of delivering that end user value and if you find that those things are drifting apart that's always bad always <laughs> always always bad i would also say um i've had a lot of success in pulling my product owner in even to the point of like having them sit with me either physically or virtually as I'm writing code mm -hmm. because they, they might, they might not be able to write code. They might not be programmers, but they can read. And if the code looks reasonable based on what they understand, if you're, if you're doing a good job of writing readable code, your product owner may have a surprisingly beneficial amount of feedback that they can give you on the code itself. Absolutely. Fortunately, we we write our code in a high level language versus assembler. So your product owner, if they understand the language you're writing it in, right, if the primary language in the code base is English, and they're an English speaking person, they know what execute means, and they know what apply means, and they know what a button is. So um, it's actually not too big of a stretch. Most of the time, you know, if you have tests that have a, like a describe statement, if the describe statement doesn't do anything what it's supposed to do, the product owner will be able to tell you that because they are usually communicating these things to you in, in using an English sentence. And, and that's what the describes um, attempt to do. Right. So if you have the ability to work that closely with your product owner, I mean, some some places that, you know, would be unheard of. Right. The product owner is off somewhere else and we're not certain where, where they are. But um, if you have access to with you know to the product owner, then that that was that's the intention, you know, behind Agile. So Okay, we're ready for another question from the list. Um, we've got several, so um, I don't know if you'll have it open where you can see it. Is there a question on the list that you would you'd like to answer? Because I know that we're not gonna get to all these, so I don't want to skip one that you were like, oh, I was really hoping we could talk about that. Um, so we have about... nine minutes left, or do we have? No, we have until. I mean, we can go as long as y'all want, but the meetup is until twelve thirty, so we've got plenty Perfect. of time. Uh, Florida, but you I know one that... that you see that that looks nice. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm looking at number six. What are your thoughts on TDD versus yes. post testing? Yes, I would love to hear from both of y'all on that. V versus okay. what? Post, post testing is what it's called. So testing after the fact, after the code's already written. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that this, this question is phrased from the perspective of, of, of the, the writing of unit tests. And so probably not like, you know, U, UI or functional or, or like, you know, big picture level testing, but more sort of fine grained. And, and I will say this testability is a primary design concern, um, for writing code. And if you're waiting until after the code is written to test it, then you're failing to design the code for testability. And like David said a little while ago, sometimes you discover that this code is really hard to test. Usually you discover that the code is hard to test because you didn't write any tests for it and you didn't learn that it's hard to test until it was too late. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, what comes to mind is there's a really cool, like the meme culture, if you're into like memes and GIFs and GIFs, I don't know how you pronounce it. There's a little bit of a of a thing there, but- is, is pronounced HIF, which is Hif. come from the Greek word <laughs> HIFA. <laughs> Which That's is right. mean pedantic argument about pronunciation. I like that. That's great. That's a good Ukrainian accent that you have there. Uh, <laughs> uh, the meme goes, it's a little girl and she says, why not both? Right? Why, why would you not test as you're writing your, your code? Because if, you, if you're a developer, have you ever added like debug statements to see like what your code was doing? That's that's Never. the worst way to test driven development, <laughs> right? Uh, you're trying to test, you're trying to drive your, your, your development with tests, but you're using console and debug statements. Go ahead and write your unit test and it'll fail. And then go ahead and write your function. And then it, it might pass depending on how you've written your test. And then write more test and it'll fail. And then write some guts to your function and then it'll pass. And you just do that over and over and over, right? And you can still add debug statements, right? If you're curious about something, or you can add an assertion to your, your unit test. Uh, and, and then it'll tell you, right? If, if it did the thing you thought it should. And then forevermore, that function should be good because your tests are green. And so I don't know, I think it's just because we don't learn to do it. Uh, if you've ever tried to help your kid with math since you learned math in school, they do it differently. <laughs> but it's still math and you're like, I know I know how to do this, but 
you're using like weird words and like round like the new math right um tdd is just it's a technique uh and i haven't yet heard of anybody give me a good argument to not do it except for they don't want to and honestly that's that's most of the reason why i feel like developers don't do tdd is is they don't want to um, they feel like it's wasting their time because their code will do what they tell it to the the blessing and the curse of the computer it does exactly what you tell it to yeah, yeah. Um, every time one of one of the other things that i've i like you, you you touched on it and i want to call this out is the idea that tdd or or just writing automated tests in general is going to cost too much time when you think about the execution time of a, of a unit test in pretty much any reasonable high level language that any of us would be using nowadays, the execution time of one of those tests is going to be on the order of milliseconds, like 10, 20 milliseconds would be a slowish test. Um, so it's reasonable to run dozens, hundreds, possibly even thousands of tests um, in an almost imperceptible amount of time. Yeah. And when you think about as you move forward, step by step by step by step, um, having that assurance that all of these existing behaviors are working as intended when I make a little change here and a little change there, mm -hmm. that gives you the op the opportunity to really move a whole lot faster instead yeah. of slow. Because if if you're moving forward in the absence of tests, you're doing this thing where you lie to yourself and you believe I can fit all of these details into my head, mm. and there's no possible way. A 200,000 line code base is still considered relatively small. You can't fit 200,000 lines of code in your head. And even if you do a good job of modularizing things, you're still talking about hundreds or thousands of lines of code. You can't fit that in your head. You need the computer to help you. Yeah, and that, that reminds me of uh, um, when programs were written initially, um, they weren't written using computers, right? Um, you wrote them down in long form and then someone else programmed the cards. And then later you got to find out if it compiled. Uh, so now that would be synonymous with if you sat down and opened Notepad or TextMate and you just wrote your program out, but you didn't, you didn't compile it, right? Because you just, you're just writing the code. You don't need to compile. It'll compile. Uh, that's the same thing with not writing tests, right? It takes too long to write the tests. It's the same as saying that it takes too long to compile. Um, compiling is cheap now, right? Almost none of us are, have ever done anything but write code, save, and compile, and link, and it does all the magic things, right? It builds. It's just a build now, and it does everything for us. Um, the test can be part of your build. Right. So just write your tests, um, and that can just be part of the process. So... Um... For the team that you know has been intending to write tests all along, and then now here we are a year in, and we still haven't started writing those tests. Uh, what tips do you have, like, to get started? Because I know I'm, I'm hearing like, just do it, but like, what specific mm -hmm. tips would you give to the the person who's been working on a project for a while? What do you want to go first? What, so what what's what's the 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 famous quip the the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago. The second best time is today. Yeah. Um. It. In general, what I've discovered when you're in a situation like that is the primary challenges are not technical ones. They are cultural. And either you have at least one person on that team who believes in the value of testing. And, and when I say believes in, I mean, we're, we're not re resurrecting Tinkerbell here. You know, clap your hands if you believe in testing. Um, <laughs> somebody who actually understands the math and understands the return on investment for testing. And you have to start there. And that person's going to have to be willing to, to spend the time and put the effort into figuring out how, how do I at least begin the process of testing. And, and making those inroads is, is usually high effort to low value. But by, by putting in that early effort, what you're doing is you're reducing the effort for the next test and the next test and the next test. So that in one little tiny pocket of this really, really big code base, this stuff gets easier because you have the confidence to be able to move forward faster. Yep, I like I like that approach. Um, for me, like big picture, right? Let's say I own a company. 
and I want to make a thing because why, why would I make a thing? Because I want to be in business tomorrow. And the way that I do that is I think of something that is needed by people and I reduce my risk to as close to zero as possible. Um, so that's the reason we run software projects the way that we do. Some folks have an issue with giving information about where they are every day or every two weeks. That's because that's not really for you. That is for people <laughs> who want to be in business to find out how is the project that I'm paying for? How, how's that going? Uh, and how risky will it be for me to not want a not have this project or b how risky will it be for me to put this project in you know project into production and get rid of the old thing uh floyd mentioned earlier right companies paying whatever they paid right to have someone come in and help them solve their quality problem uh, they didn't plant that tree 30 years ago they said floyd come in and plant this tree now and we need it to be 50 foot high and we need it by the next quarter so that's the reason why we say, go ahead and test now. You'll find out you're not very good at it potentially, and you'll start solving those issues, right? You'll start reaching out to friends that you think might be able to help with that. Uh, and then you'll find out how much you didn't know about your code base uh, when you go to write tests, you know, before or after, right? There's a thing known as living documentation um, or executable documentation. Um, if you've never worked with a system that has that, um, then you don't know what it feels like, right? You, you've been you've been riding your bicycle across a wire over a ravine, right? And you and you didn't ever look down to notice, but when you start riding those tests, you're like, oh my, <laughs> we could have fallen off at any moment, right? And and then it could have been catastrophic. So, yeah. um, someone with a testing mindset, I think, like what Floyd mentioned, that that's what they do, right? I ask all the time when a, a story gets finished, I said, okay, let's go to prod with it. And they're like, whoa, 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 we, we need to test it. Wait a second. Uh, well, so you didn't test it? I thought you were, you said it was done. So you can get that feeling for how confident they are in, mm -hmm. in the code that they're writing or the product thing, how it integrates with other pieces by asking them, can we go to prod? Because if you can't, we're, we're not done as a team. The there's a really, really awesome book, and I think I have it sitting. Yes, I do. Um, this is one of the few books that I keep like within arm's reach of me all the time because it's got so much good stuff in it, and it's this book, Accelerate. Um, highly, 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 highly recommend reading this book. Um, and, of course, my webcam flakes out right as I hold it up. Isn't that awesome? Um, one of the things that you'll learn from this book um, is that Based on industry research, there's, there's a very, very broad scoped um, industry survey uh, across all kinds of organizations that do technology and software development. And one of the interesting sort of trailing indicators of their ability to deliver on, uh, to deliver software well, one of those indicators is deployment frequency. And how, which, which is to say, how often are you deploying your code to production? The organizations that are doing it really, really well uh, are doing it multiple times a day, basically on demand. Organizations that are having quality problems, the ones that are doing a bad job of testing, delivering multiple times a day all the way to production is terrifying to them because they're thinking there's no possible way we can deliver that well, that fast, that often. And generally speaking, what, what that means is that if you reverse the process, back 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 to when the when the the developer puts his hands on the keyboard or her hands on the keyboard and says i'm going to write this feature that feature isn't being written to production level quality one of the big reasons why it's not production level quality is because you don't have tests for it and so you don't know whether or not it's going to break so i'm going to interrupt with a question from twitch about how y'all feel about tests with multiple assertions I'll, 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 I'll bite. Um, there's, so you hear t a single test, not a single assertion period, but um, you also have interesting things like, for instance, uh, in, in writing, cause I, I do a lot of C sharp here, here lately. Um, 
I use a library called Fluent Assertions that gives me deep equality checking. So if I've got a big wad of data that I need to put through some sort of transformation and make sure that the, the wad of data that I get out of the transformation is in this shape with all of these particular properties on it, I could write a test for each and every individual property and each and every individual nested property. Um, and the value of doing all of those teeny tiny little itty bitty tests versus I have a library that says you expected the object to be shaped like this, but the one that you got wasn't, it's shaped like that. It's a single assertion that gives you rich information that I would say is okay. Now the flip side of this, which is, I think the, the nature of the question that you're asking is, um, multiple assertions in the in the same test validating different things about the system under test that probably deserve to to have their own test and and the 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 question that i ask is do those assertions um work together to tell you the reason why the system under test did or did not behave the way you expected it to so if if those assertions are representing different expectations then i i would say they belong in different tests Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that. Um, and I would say, if you're having a difficult time deciding if you should have multiple assertions in your unit test or not, have multiple assertions, and then make a note, right, create an issue or however you whatever your to do function is, right, do this later. Um, tests are code. So they need to be refactored, um, just the same as anything else, right. And so go ahead and write it. If you've got multiple assertions, go ahead and do that. And then make a note that you need to contact, you know, get in, you know, let's have a discussion. Maybe you don't understand the requirement. Maybe you don't understand the intention behind the store. That's a way, that's kind of, that's a smell, right? That we were talking about earlier. Um, and then push come to shove. The test, tests at this level are cheap. Write another test, right? Write another test. Uh, if you find yourself writing 10 tests that are exactly the same, except for one parameter, you probably have yourself uh, a scenario where you can write some data-driven tests, right? So you write one test that takes a parameter and, and it takes in a table of data. And right now it just has one column, right? And so maybe you need to assert that every state except for Oklahoma is allowed to be in the dropdown, right? So you'd have 50 states and you'd have <clears throat> assertions of true on all of them except for Oklahoma that will need to be false and if that test comes back with those 50 tests and it's accurate then you've that was that's that uh, benefit that we were talking about earlier right you do a little bit of test coding and you get 50 tests right um, and then if you know Puerto Rico ever makes it in as a state you go to that data table and you add Puerto Rico right and it's as easy as that um, I would also say Sometimes a, a desire to 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 point at oh this test has multiple assertions therefore it's bad. Um, sometimes that's a sign that the test is hard to write, and a lot of times I've seen this happen where where the arrange phase of the test is is gigantic and labyrinthine, and so you've got this giant pile of arrange code, and then you've got this act and then you've got this giant pile of assertions and what winds up happening it's the broken window effect it's a whole lot easier to just stuff another assertion into this into this pile of assertions than it is to untangle the mess and i i would i would again say and i man i love it when you say tests are code like <laughs> it just warms my heart i love that Tests are code, and your code is trying to tell you something. It's trying to tell you, I'm really messy. Will you clean me up, please? Hey, Floyd, uh, you mentioned a library a few minutes ago. What was the name of that? Fluent Assertions. And so Fluent. it's, an, it's, it's, um, it's an, a NuGet package. So if you're in writing C Sharp, um, Fluent Assertions is pretty freaking awesome. Yeah, and Fletch posted a link to that. So thank you. Uh, Matthew asked, outside of code coverage, what are some useful metrics to illustrate the value that tests bring to a given product? Uh, I'm going to go first since Floyd already said it. That little book that he held up, uh, Go Out and Read Anything by Forsgren. Kim, uh, who's the third author? Uh, Jess Humble. Yeah. Anything by any of those three folks, you need to read them and then reread them. Um, it will change yeah. your life. Um, Dr. Forsgren, 
uh, man, if you just did anything in the book, right, any of the things that they touch on, you'll have, you'll have, you know, changed, you know, your, your product owner or your project management's life. Um, things go so much more smoothly. Um, you're, you're twisting, you're, you're, you're switching it, right? How do we, how do we deliver code faster? Well, it's not typing faster, right? It's delivering whatever that hard thing is. You need to do that so much more. If it's super hard to deploy, you need to deploy every day. And when you can't, you need to figure out why, right? That's what retro is for. How are we doing this? Why can't we do it every day? I ask it every new team I get on. I, I ask, you know, what, why aren't we going to prod? Let's go to prod. And they start giving me all the reasons, right? That's a punch list of things you can work on in your DevOps, right? Platform, your team that's supposed to be able to deliver self-organized and being able to do it, you know, without, you know, if you're a self-sufficient team, if you can't deploy, you've got to ask Bill, right? And he's out for vacation. So we can't deploy till Monday. You're not continuously delivering and you're not continuously deploying. And it doesn't matter what you've named your team. So I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, some, some really awesome metrics to look at are um, things like change failure rate. How, how frequently do you have a bug or a critical um, outage in production? How, how often does that happen? Um, this, is, this is your bug rate. This is how often are we shipping broken code? um as a percentage so if, so if we sh if we ship weekly or if we ship monthly um how often do those weekly or monthly um deployments or releases have bugs in them uh a lot of organizations don't even know that they don't even know how badly broken their stuff is if you um, ask you're usually the first one they're like well, right. who are you and why are you <laughs> right why are you but if you talk to a business person about that they're gonna go oh crap we don't, we don't know, or they're going to say, well, duh, it's a hundred percent. There's bugs in everything. And when you, when you say, well, here's what the industry research says about this. Um, the organizations that are doing it well, change failure rate is between zero and 15%. So you're, you're getting a failure once, you know, zero to three times out of every 20. Um, and then another one that I would also look at is what, what is your mean time to recovery? So given a given broken code and prod, how long does it take you to fix that broken code and prod? Uh, how long does it take you to write the fix, make sure the fix is tested, everything like that, and get it back out to prod the top performing organizations in the world do that in under an hour. So then like, like David said, you've got to ask the question of what's in the way of us being able to do that. And let's go fix that. But if you talk, if you want to talk about how do you demonstrate the, the value to the business, you say, here's here, here's how we rate. Here's how like middle level performers in the industry rate. Here's how the top performers rate. Um, here's this level of performance that's possible if we do these things. Yeah. And it's interesting having that conversation too, because sometimes what you find out is that you haven't even considered buying uh, the tool, a tool, any tool that would allow you to do that yet they think because Amazon can do it, that that organization can do it too. Cause Amazon has developers and I have developers. So um, they haven't even considered finding out, you know, where's my continuous, you know, integration, my CI CD pipeline. What is it? How fast, you know, what, what are capabilities? Um, the, the other aspect or one of the things you mentioned about metrics, um, failed deployments. How often do, when you go to deploy and you think everything's good and buttoned up, does that deployment fail? Meaning nodes don't come back up, the website's inaccessible, the database, you know, chugged along and then didn't, you know, wasn't available, right? At, you know, that means that you don't have consistency in your deployment. Um, and when you really need it most, it, it may not be there for you, right? When you really need to get your site up because it's Christmas and you're selling this, you know, the hot ticket, the PS5, right? We've seen those websites. If you've been trying to get a PS5, they weren't ready. They, we, they were gone. Those, they were 404ing all over the place uh, and they were just not even responding at all, right? So um, the, the users will help you test too, right? The question earlier about before or after, if you do nothing, 
you'll at least get some testing from users in production. Mm -hmm. That's expensive testing. Super, super expensive because it's your reputation, right? At a minimum. Uh, I know when I use a product and it doesn't work, I go off and use the competitors for a while and then come back later, maybe, right? You've, they've lost me for a while uh, because I, they, we've broken trust. Um, they said they would do something and they didn't do it, so. Yeah, so you're talking about manual testing. Is there anything else you want to say about manual testing on the team, manual versus automated? Uh, Floyd, do you want to go? Um, yeah, so one, one of the things that you've really got to deconstruct on a software development team is if you've got, you've got a team member whose specialty is um, quality engineering or, or quality assurance, you've got to get out of the mindset that this is the tester. This is the person who does the testing. This is dangerous, it's toxic, and you will produce garbage code this way. This is the person whose perspective it is that you want to leverage at every level. Because this is, this is the person who can tell you what are, what are the edge cases for this particular algorithm where we're figuring out something fine-grained. They'll also be able to tell you, um, hey, we don't have any, any tests that actually poke and prod at the UI and tell us whether or not um, we can log in. They're also the person that's going to actually go open the app using their keyboard and mouse and look at it and go, hey, have you noticed that the username field is here and the password field is like all janky off to the left over here? This is bad. We should probably fix that. Um, and what winds up happening, so, so number one, if, if this person is, is covering all of the bases with um, manual testing, that's far too much work for any one human, regardless of whether or not it's one, one QE and one programmer or it's one QE and half a dozen programmers. And so the only possible way for them to get over the hump is automate, um, which means that QE is a consultant for you to figure out what's, what's the level of automation, what's the level of manual testing that's appropriate. And that, that, that breakdown is going to be different based on your team, based on your skills, based on your industry, based on the software that you're writing, based on your tech stack, based on all kinds of other things. And so I'm, I'm not going to give you a, a magic percentage ratio. This is how much manual versus this is how much automation. But I promise you, um, if you've got that the right perspective, and, and if you're thinking about testing from the perspective of, I want to leverage the computer to do the, the tedious crap that humans suck at, and I want to leverage a human to do the stuff that a computer can't tell me. And as much as possible, I want to have the humans doing as much of the latter and the computers doing as much of the former as possible. You'll figure out the right ratio. Um, and that, that's good. I, I really like that. Um, I'm going to steal again from uh, Michael Bolton and James Bach. Um, they beat a dead horse with um, a term called exploratory testing. Um, it's actually very scientific. You said earlier about the math, you know, if you've got someone that understands the mathematics around testing and risk reduction and things of that nature, um, go check out those two gentlemen. They're not the only ones that talk about it, but that's the, the ones that I am the most familiar with. Um, you know, there are scenarios, right, that we think our users should always be able to do. And so what they suggest is that you create a destination, right? to be able to achieve that thing that we know the user needs to be able to do. Um, and then try to get to that destination in different ways, right? You're gonna explore the application. Um, maybe you can add something to the cart from after having searched, or maybe you didn't search. Maybe you just saw something in, you know, in a carousel and you clicked on it there. Um, there's multiple ways to arrive at items in your cart. Um, so you can write these things down, right? There's, there's easy ways to, denote, you know, as an explorer, the path that you took. And then what you do is as you're doing that, and you can do it with another tester or another developer, write down the things that look weird, right? Write down the things that you notice. Um, that's what your users are going to do. They're going to notice that what you mentioned earlier, the first, the, the names like this and the passwords like that, right? We don't think that's probably the way that user expects to be able to enter, enter those fields. So in your exploratory, you spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and you write down all the things that you notice, and some of them are going to be defects or bugs, and some of them are going to be UX, you know, things that the designers can take a look at, and some of them are going to be things that the product owner goes, it shouldn't ever be that way. I don't know why you're able to do, you know, get that into the cart in that form or fashion. We don't want them to do that. Um, and so they're time boxed, 
and they are, you know, you, you can, there are different ways to document the ways that you explored. And then you're not just flailing about and clicking things and they say, well, how did you get there? And you're like, I don't know, right? That doesn't help if you've ever been a developer and they say, well, I found a bug and they're like, well, where'd you find it? And they're like, I don't know, I couldn't get it to do it again. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll go fix a bug and then maybe that'll be the one you found. I don't know. <laughs> something loose, and uh, something tightened, right? So. <laughs> right. So we talked a lot about the benefits of testing. Is testing ever not good? And when is it not good? And specifically for unit tests, when are they not good? It, it, if you're testing for the purpose of increasing your code coverage, that's not good. That's that's never, ever, 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 ever good. If, if there's a number of tests or a kind of code coverage that you're trying to get to, and that's that's your purpose for writing the test, those are almost always going to cause harm because you're you're adding dead weight that still has to be maintained. And instead of those tests doing what they're supposed to do, which is to, to David's earlier point, serving as living documentation, this is the expected behavior of the system. Instead, those tests are just following a path through the code for the purpose of, of turning the, the, the numbers up. David, I'm gonna pass it off to you at this point. <laughs> um, so if the question, if the, if the point of the question is to ask, do you have permission to not write tests? I'm gonna say the answer is no. You will not get my permission. Uh, feel free to not write the tests though. Um, there's a book called Legacy Code. Uh, and I haven't read the book, but a friend of mine said, because I, I asked him, like, what, what's their definition? And Floyd mentioned it earlier. Legacy code is code that doesn't have any testing. Are you talking about the Michael Feathers book? Maybe. Okay. Um, it, if you're in, in that situation where you didn't plant the tree 30 years ago, and, and you need some tactical advice for how do I wrangle the code, yeah. um, if that's the book you're talking about, great book. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. book. But I, I liked how you can move from legacy code to just code by by getting some tests around what you're doing. Um, if you've ever done any kind of professional services or anything and you've been asked to make a change in a code base that you've seen for literally five minutes and there aren't any tests, you're like, well, I'm pretty much going to break this because <laughs> you don't have any of the history, right? You don't know why that thing that's a comment. I'm, I actually was part of an organization where one of the comments allowed it to compile properly. Otherwise they would get a bug. It would crash the program if that comment weren't there. And the name of the comment was magic comment, please do not delete. So sometimes things are there and you think you're fixing it and you un, un you know, you pull on this string and it unravels the whole, you know, sweatshirt or whatever. Tests kind of give you at least a little bit of some, some guide rails, right? To know what the program is supposed to be capable of doing based off the tests. Yeah, those so, are some good answers. No, you should always test. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so we are getting a little bit closer now to 1230. And I'll ask again if there are any questions on the list that you were kind of hoping we would get to. I think we have started to touch on most of them. Um, how testing affects other developers. QA, technical writers and users, um, how testing shapes your code. I think we talked about that. Um, can I, can I, I mention something out of band? Please. Uh, so uh, men you mentioned earlier in the announcements, the OKC free code camp. Yes. So if you are getting started in automated testing, more than likely at some point in time, you will encounter HTML. You should go and take as much and go through as much of the free code camp as you possibly can. It will go very granular and very like explanatory about how HTML and CSS work and the interactions and why things do what they do. And that will help you tremendously when you go to try to start driving a website. You'll have a leg up on which selectors and how you should mm -hmm. use those and which ones are gonna be reliable. Um, so I, I would, and then you can have a conversation, right, with the fun, front end developers and say, hey, can you slap an ID on that uh, element for me? I'd appreciate that. And they'll go, how do you know about IDs? <laughs> <laughs> and you'll say, well, but because I'm a software developer like you, I just do testing. So mm -hmm. um, it, it helps. So, <clears throat> David, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. w would you agree or disagree with the following statement? To be an effective um, quality assurance engineer, you need to be able to write some code. Uh, to be effective, I think so, yes. Um, I think it's gonna be extremely difficult. Um, 
because I think at a minimum you need to be able to read code and the best way to be able to read code is to have fought with code that was yours in the past, right? So even if you're just going out to W3 schools, right, and clicking on try it out and you play around and see what different things do, right? If you're a tester, you're probably pretty curious by nature um, and, and to some degree a stickler for detail. Um, maybe you're checking people's grammar, right, as you read things. Those are all kind of signs of, of someone who kind of has a testing mindset, right? A critical mindset. Um, and it's funny, you should talk about that. Like developers that know that you know what the code does, you automatically get like 10 points of like, of cred, right? Street cred. Um, and, and honestly, when you go to test, I go right to the places that developers hate for you to go test, right? If they are doing something with regular expressions, it's so <laughs> fun. It is so fun to go in there and see if they've escaped all the characters they were supposed to, right? Um, you can go and see what they what they escaped with their regular expression. So you automatically know which test that you can write that is going to cause it to do what it's not supposed to do. So it's you know that black box versus you know white box texting testing. So um, they, they definitely. <laughs> <laughs> they won't throw things over the fence because the fence is clear and you can like watch them making, making the bugs as they type them, right? When they check them in and the pull requests and you're like, ah, I think you might be, you might have some null refs in there if we leave it the way it is right now. And so then it, then it gets fun. So I would definitely encourage you to, to write. It, it's so, it's so like available these days. Um, there's also, I'll plug a, another place, Test Automation University. Um, all the cool kids are over there. Angie Jones um, kind of heads that up uh, as their evangelist and as a Java champion uh, and a lot of other stuff. So um, go, go check out that website. We can drop some of these links for books and things um, after the, after the talk is over. But yeah, David, I assume you've seen this, this tweet, this, this is like, this is programming legend. Let me see here. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. It's funny, we, we uh, on the team I'm working on, uh, they wrote the exact calculation you're supposed to, but they didn't trim it. So it had like, you know, 15 places of significance. So <laughs> they were like, oh, crap. <laughs> I need to go, you know, trim what's displayed, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, um, good, good QEs they have this, it, it's almost an occult nature about them. Like they, they, they can figure out the incantations to make your code misbehave. And I well, love- Well, mainly it's about being a horrible user, right? If you just do <laughs> things that users, you, you just aren't supposed to do, like click, like click like 10 times in a row on something. You shouldn't ever do that. But when you do that and it breaks on the seventh time, every time you found a bug. Right. But nobody well, else has clicked it seven times. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I'm just going to use some really strong language here. Bad programmers hate QEs like that because they're discovering the flaws in the way that they're building the app. And and these these are like, yeah, no realistic. It's like a love hate, right? Yeah, I I know it. it no re, no reasonable user is going to behave like this except for that one that does. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and a lot and of not all things that you find. Bug, yeah. Not all bugs are high priority, right? That, right? that click seven times in a row, that's not high priority, but it does exist. And yeah. maybe if it exists on that button, maybe it exists somewhere else. Yeah. And maybe and if it's a game, that, you're going to click on that thing seven times. Yeah. Because that, people click. That's the scary part because you, you find a bug like this. Okay, nobody's going to click on this button seven times in a row or 14 times in a row or 174 times in a row or whatever. So we're going to prioritize that low. More than likely, part of the, the the choice to prioritize that low is because the developer is freaking out going, oh, mm -hmm. do you have any idea how much I'm going to have to change to fix that? And and that, I don't, that, but ugh, I am it, so like, interested to find out what it will look like when you do. Right. And and <laughs> like the, the reason why they go, oh, is because everybody now knows the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. You know, you know, I, when I write some automated tests for mobile Nobody runs a mobile app like my son when he's on Snapchat. I swear to the Lord, he's clicking. He looks like he's playing the piano. These kids these days, like they're not, it's not one click at a time. They're multi-clicking, swiping, 
because every app has a different way to like get out of whatever it is that you're doing. He does not stop tapping and swiping until it does what he wants it to do. So it's interesting, you know, that we think we're doing testing, but we're definitely not, dri- we're not driving that car the way they're driving that car, right? We're putting our blinker on and we're turning right. They're slamming it into four wheel drive and taking it over the curb and they expect for it to be correct. So it's interesting. They'll, they'll swipe, close an app as the second action. If it doesn't do what they think it should do, they'll swipe, close it and bring it back up. Wow. Yeah. Most tests, right, that you write, don't do that. They don't swipe, close, and bring it back up and then see what happens and see what state, you know, if you were able to save your state while you were waiting on the database to come back. <laughs> but that's what they do. It's like it's like guerrilla testing. Right. Very interesting. So we are at 1230. Uh, so we're going to, I think, uh, wrap it up with one last question for David. We've worn the dog out, it looks like. she's. Yes, enough. she was earlier barking in her sleep. I was worried that would come through on the stream, but I don't think it did. <laughs> um, so yeah, we will uh, invite people to join the call and y'all can keep chatting as long as you want, but we're going to get one more question in and then say goodbye to the stream. Question is for David um, from JP Billings. There tend to be two paths into testing, dev to tester and BA slash supports tester. What advice do you have for BA support to tester when it's time in their career to start learning about automation? Um, and so it's interesting that you, you think there's two paths. I would actually say there's like thousands, right? I know people that are chemistry majors that went into testing, music majors, teachers. Teachers are actually really good because developers are actually like children. And so they do <laughs> elementary ed is actually a, an excellent field to study and then go right into testing. So... <laughs> Uh, but let's go back to your question, um, BAs. Um, if you, this is just me making an assumption. If you are afraid of code, go ahead and just don't be afraid of code. It's, it's, if we were in the assembler times, like I mentioned earlier, by all means, be scared to death, right? It, it's a little daunting to find, you know, figure out that you're messing with, you know, memory allocations and moving memory around and things like that. Um, but the languages these days, JavaScript is now, as of late, a you know, primary, a mature language, right? Type if you if you want to start in TypeScript, you're going to be you know just as C sharpy in Java as anybody else, right? Nobody can say anything badly about you. But um, I, and the other thing is, don't stop reading. Go find these books, right? And when they when you don't understand a word in the book, highlight it. Take a screenshot, send it to somebody you think might. Drop it in the channel for the Techlahoma Slacks. You know, you can tell from Floyd and I, we love talking, right? We'll 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 we'll, we'll chat back and forth with you in the Slack. You know, um, that's what we're here for, right? That's the point of these these meetups is um, to allow people a space, a safe space, to to find out more about whatever topic it is that they're interested in. So. Yeah, read, watch. Uh, if also, if you want to go out to the Safari books online, Kimberly probably knew I was going to talk about this at some point. They do ten day free trials. Sign up with your email address. If you have a Gmail, you can do your name plus a number, and do it as many times as you think you need. Read books, watch videos. They have sandboxes out there that you can run through, like to learn about Docker or any of those things. It's super easy to to get information and find out things these days. So. Um. I will I will jump in and add to that. So if if you're looking at a career shift from like either BA or support into um, into quality, if if you're a BA, you're already a details person, and if if you're not, you're not a very good BA. Um, which is probably to say, if if you want to make that shift, being good at the details is probably a pretty clear sign you're going to have some success, or you at least have the capability for success. Uh, and in support, same kind of thing. Um, you have to be a details person because in support, you're constantly going through that process of making sure that the user actually did what they said they did and or, and or walking the user through a little teeny tiny step at a time. And, and what you're doing is you're developing that, that details oriented mindset. And so you're well poised there. I would also say, think about what's you you're looking for the path into quality well what's your, what's what's the next what's the next path do you want to go into quality because you want to become a developer do you want to go into quality because you eventually want to become a product manager do you want to go into quality because you eventually want to become like a director of quality or or something along those lines and 
If you don't know the answer to that, that's okay. But open your mind to those possibilities because what you're going to discover is that those that opens the doors to what like things that really ignite your passions and help propel you forward. Yeah, I would add two things to that. If you have someone that you report to right now and they know you're a BA, say, I know that the testing team of just Dave over there is probably really swamped. <laughs> I'd love to help with testing. Um, I know a lot of groups, right, that have BAs that help because they know what, like Floyd said, they know what it's supposed to be doing already, right, because they were helping get the requirements together and get the acceptance criteria together. Um, and then the second thing is, uh, there's an organization called ISTQB, and I always get the letters wrong, but we can drop the link later. There's a foundation level testing there. The syllabuses are out and available for you to read. Just read and understand that syllabus. Um, ping, I mean, I'm, I'm studying for it myself right now. Um, that'll get you some um, basic base level knowledge about how to approach testing. Um, and it might, might be things you're already familiar with, right? Like edge cases and boundary testing, things like that. Um, but this will give you some formalized training, right? So maybe you learned mathematics just from your buddy, but then you read the math book and you're like, oh, that's called the additive property or the whatever, right? You'll get some names for things that you already know how to do. Um, and then go ahead and, you know, take the test, right? Take the practice test if there are some that are out there that are available and kind of see how you do, right? Um, and then, yeah, get that foundation level cert certification. Um, it's pretty reasonably priced. And then put it on your LinkedIn resume, right? And then you can start making some decisions about can you transition to something like that in your current organization or, you know, w would you be open to, to changing jobs? So those are those are my recommendations. Um, yeah, I just want to mention we're five, five, six minutes over. So let's wrap this up and um, kill the stream and then we can keep chatting on the call. But go ahead. Okay. Um, real quickly, um, as, as somebody who's been the hiring manager for technical organizations, there are not enough people out there with that quality and testing mindset. And so like this, this is an area of the industry that is incredibly valuable, it, unbelievably valuable because I've struggled and I've wrestled with teams who they have a tester on the team. They don't have a quality person on the team. So if you if you want to get into this, like if if you can get out of my job is to click the buttons with with my own two hands, and and your um, if you can get from that to my job is to make sure that we've got the right level of investment in the right kinds of testing for the right kinds of features, and you can you can communicate that effectively w both with your team and with your product management or or someone like that. There's so much space in this industry for you. So it like. Please, please, we need you. 